check this out. What you're seeing here is a bunch of agents that have all never seen this level before. This level is in fact procedurally generated and the agents must somehow overcome the obstacles right here. You can see there's stumps, there's gaps. The green one is performing pretty well right here. Coincidentally, the green one is also what we're going to look at in today's paper. The idea here is, as I said, these agents have never seen these environments and the environments are procedurally generated. Every time I hit reset here, a different environment is created. And also notably on the right side right here, I have these sliders which with which I can tr control the uh, different properties of the procedurally generated environments, such as how wide the gaps are, how many steps to the stairs there are. And as I modify these, you can see the environments, they get more and more challenging as I slide these things to the right hand side. Now, they get super challenging at some point. And the question is, how do we train an agent using reinforcement learning in order to be able to solve these challenging environments, because it's pretty clear that um, if I want an agent to solve an environment like this, and it, remember, it's a procedurally generated environment. So I can't just train it on the same environment over and over and over again until it gets it. Uh, if I want to train an agent to solve the family of environments that are very hard here, it's almost impossible to do so using from scratch reinforcement learning, because there's just never any success uh, of any of the agents, like they never finish an episode, they never get good reward, they always stumble at the first obstacle. Um, and so what's the what's the way we, I still want the green one to, to actually make this come on green one, come on. I'll, it's not going to make it right. So the idea is that what we want to do is we want to develop a curriculum. So a curriculum means that we're going to use this ability to create levels of different difficulties to guide the agent to learn more, uh, no, to learn more and more difficult environments. So we're going to start with very easy environments, very flat environments, not many gaps in them, not many stairs in them. So fairly easy environments like this. And we use reinforcement learning and try to teach the agent just to solve this level. Now, most of them will do a fairly good job at that level. As you can see, not too much of a problem. Some stumble, some don't, but you know, this is solvable. And then we will progressively as the agent gets better and better, increase the difficulties of the level. And using that using that uh, difficulty increase over time, there is a chance that the agents they learn more and more and more what it uh, in they learn more and more to go and solve these levels. So from scratch learning of the difficult environment environments might not be possible. However, there is a chance if we design a curriculum, in the correct sequence of difficulties for the agents to learn. This is not unlike humans learn in, uh, you may have heard of this, uh, what you want to do is train in the zone of proximal development or something like this, which, which essentially means that you want to always challenge yourself just outside of your current abilities. And that's how you maximize your progress in learning. That's the same idea that we have here with these evolving curricula over time. So the paper we're going to look at is called Evolving Curricula with Regret Based Environment Design by Jack Parker Holder and Minky Jiang and others, mainly by Meta AI, but there's a bunch of collaborations with UCL, UC Berkeley, University of Oxford. And yeah, I guess that's it. Um, so this paper combines the uh, recent developments in regret based algorithms that go about uh, making a curriculum and evolution, which is another way that people go about this. So the paper proposes to train a single agent, not a family of agents, a single agent that is generally capable of solving all kinds of difficulties and levels. And to do that via an automated curriculum that is given by a teacher algorithm, the teacher algorithm itself is not learned, the teacher algorithm is actually defined by a a, like a, this schematic right here. And all of this is regret based, which makes it independent of kind of domain specific heuristics. So the goal of this algorithm right here is to 
have a general algorithm to design these curricula without being reliant on essentially creating a new heuristics for all of the different uh, tasks it needs to solve. So we're going to look at it. Here's a brief overview over the algorithm itself. How does it do it? How does it get an agent to learn step by step? And the most difficult question is, you know, how fast do you increase with the difficulties of your levels? Because if you increase not fast enough that you're essentially stuck in learning, if you increase the difficulty too fast, you have the same problem again in that the agent will not be capable of of keeping up. So what you want to do is you want to have some sort of a level generator. And that is what we just saw before in in this uh, on web demo, by the way, you can go look, uh, try out this web demo for yourself at axelagent.github.io. I'll obviously, I'll link it in the description to this video. But you want to have some sort of a level generator, which is essentially the thing that I have here on the right, I want to have the ability to create different levels. Uh, this doesn't need to be parameterized like it is here. For example, in this maze world that they portray right here, all I have is an empty room, and then I have the ability to place uh, blocks in it. So every pixel can either be a wall or not a wall. And that's it. That's a generator, the generator can just place blocks. And, and that's it, there's no need for uh, for some sort of a slider here that controls the difficulty, that's going to be done completely automatically, you'll as you'll see. So once we have the generator, we could already build some sort of an curriculum algorithm, right, we could just sample different levels from the generator, and then just train the agent on all of them. However, that wouldn't amount to a much of a curriculum, as it would probably generate easy and hard levels all you know, throughout each other. And the agent would be able to solve the easy levels, maybe a little bit and then maybe a bit of the harder levels. But it's if you don't sequence this correctly, um, that there's a there's a big chance that you're going to fail, uh, mostly because you, as the level design space gets higher and higher, uh, most levels are either going to fall in the too easy or way too hard section, and not a lot are going to be in that zone of proximal development, and therefore you don't have much of a learning signal. So we need to somehow filter and 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 curate these levels that we generate. So we have a generator and the generator simply gives us the starting bunch of levels. And I, I believe I'm, I'm, uh, you can also go to the generator within the algorithm and so on. But imagine the generator gives us just a bunch of starting levels. This is one of these starting levels. I'm going to take a different color right here. Otherwise, you won't see. That's even worse. Thank you. Hmm. So the generator gives us a bunch of starting levels. And these go to the student again, the student here, that's a single agent, that is not a family of agents, uh, the evolutionary methods here are not in re with regard to the student, but to the levels themselves. So there's one student that trains on all the different levels. So what we do is we simply evaluate, we ask, we, we let the student run on this level, and we see how well it does. And we're going to measure its regret. So the regret of a student, we're going to get to that measure, it's essentially an estimate of how far the student is away from the optimal policy on that particular level. And what we want to do is we want to strictly select for levels that have high regret. So levels where the student is far away from the optimal policy, because those are the levels where the student can still learn something. And if we do that correctly, then this automatically sequences this, uh, these levels in the in the in the sequence of difficulty such that they're always just at the edge of what the student can do. And you'll see how that works in a bit. So we want to measure their regret. And we have this we have the buffer right here. The buffer is where all the levels that we currently think are interesting to for the student to learn at uh, reside. This buffer is managed by the curator that uh, the curator is essentially just, it's just a, a bucket of levels that um, that we think are interesting. What we then do is we can replay those levels. So we can actually train the student on the levels. But we also if we just train the students on these levels, uh, that's not much of an interesting thing. So we also need a way to update that buffer. 
And the way we update the buffer is we select some of the levels for editing. So some of the levels we think, okay, um, these are good levels, but could we make them like just a bit more difficult because the student can solve them now. So what's a way to make them more difficult, then we send them through an editor. And the editor, again, this can be pretty much anything. So in our example up here, the editor could simply either place another block right here, or remove a block. What is important is that different from the generator, the generator just generates a new thing, while the editor modifies the existing things. And the assumption is that um, if I modify something that has a difficulty x, right, then if I modify it to x hat, then the difficulty of x hat will not be too much different. So what I'm going to do is I'm at, let's say here is the student's starting point, and the student increases its ability round by round. So maybe this is the zone that the student can solve right now. And I select a level that is here, so the student can just about solve it. And then I modify that with the editor a little bit. And I maybe produce a produce different offspring, like here, 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 and here. So what I want to do is I want to select for the offspring. And here's where that's where the evolutionary method comes in. I want to select for the offspring that it will will make progress for the student so that the student just can't solve right now and add that to the buffer of things where I do reinforcement learning on. So with the editor, I create a bunch of different offspring for this level, uh, as we see right here. And I evaluate the student on them, I measure the students regret. And if the regret is high, I put that back into the buffer. So in this way, I always keep the buffer filled with levels that the student just can't like it's just at the zone of where the student can solve them. So if I now add the blue circled levels, obviously, the next, you know, I'm going to increase my ability to out here a little bit in this direction, right. And then maybe here is another level that I modify with these two, and that increases the student's ability uh, to here. And then from these levels, I will again, create offspring, maybe to here and here, again, I will filter out the ones that become easier. Um, and so, as you can see, the students abilities, they will continually increase guided by this metric of this regret. So that's the entire algorithm, essentially, you'll have one student that is generally capable, and the buffer right here, will always contain levels that the student just can can't or just about can solve by measure of these regret and continuously editing. Obviously, this doesn't work everywhere. Like there needs there's a lot of preconditions for this to work. For example, you need to be able to have this level generator and level editor, uh, you need to be able to create levels of various difficulties, not out of the box, but it like should be possible in principle, there, there should be the possibility of creating a curriculum in the first place, which is not possible for all the uh, tasks, especially with the condition that if I modify the problem a little bit, uh, like this thing right here, if I modify the problem a little bit, then the the difficulty should only mod be modified by a little bit like that is not a given for many, many tasks. However, if this is all given, uh, then it becomes suddenly possible. And of course, we run into all the problems of having a single student, like there's catastrophic forgetting and so on. But we don't we don't worry about this right here. Uh, as you might have seen previously, that the Excel agent right here, this um, the green agent, no matter kind of what the terrain is, its strategy is always sort of the same. So its strategy is always to kind of hold one leg out and bounce on the hind leg. And okay, that that might not have been. Um, so it will always, it's not going to make that it always bounce on the hind leg, actually, most of them will do it bounce on the hind leg and kind of wiggle the front leg. And that's how it bridges gaps and stairs and ladders and so on. Okay, mo most of them do that. But you'll see that this is a problem of I think having a single single agent solve these things. Uh, 
if you want a single agent to be solved to solve all the environments that means that implicitly kind of one one strategy or one set of strategies must be enough to solve all the environments which is also not a given for much of the world of reinforcement learning however this can all be fixed so this was the overview now let's dive into a little bit um, more into the algorithm itself again we have not yet we there's still a crucial element and that is this regret that we haven't talked about yet but the algorithm in code looks like this um i want to i want to initialize a policy that this is the student policy pi and this level buffer so the buffer is uh is lambda i guess lambda okay so i'm going to sample some initial levels and i'll just assume that the initial levels here uh, they're they're going to be mixed in difficulty. So there are going to be some some easy levels and some hard levels and some levels that the student might just be able to solve out of the box or not. Um, yeah. So well, then we're going into a while loop, the big like while not converged. We're going to sample a replay decision and the replay decision is essentially it's a binary variable that tells me do I want to uh, take a level from the buffer or do I want to take a level from the a new level from the generator because if you only have initial levels in your buffer right then you're kind of limited by the evolution of these levels so much unlike we have non-convex optimization problems in deep learning uh, these these landscapes of levels might be super duper non-convex and um that's why if you just evolve a bunch of levels, there is the, obviously the danger that you get that you sort of narrow, like you, you never. So if you if you go down a bunch, if you teach the agent to go like down a bunch of stairs and, and you go ever more and more stairs, more and more stairs, but the initial levels never had like a big cliff like this, uh, your agent will not be able to solve it even with this method because no amount of adding stair steps will get you to the big cliff. And that's why it's important to every now and then actually sample a level from the level generator to bring some diversity in there. Because that's what I see with this method is probably pretty easy to teach yourself into a corner. So if we have something from the level generator, um, we collect the trajectory. And it's important that we have two different modes right here, we have the student in evaluation mode. So every time that we have some level, some new level, we first evaluate the student on it, we want to know whether the student can actually solve it or not on how well it can solve it. So what do we do? We compute the approximate regret, we don't actually train on this level, we just evaluate it. And that is a property, I think that reduces the signal to noise ratio tremendously, we want to pre filter what levels we train on, we don't just want to train on all of them. So this is a, this is a, interestingly enough, a method where, uh, even though we have the training data available, it seems to be better if we filter the training data, it's still good training data, right? Any of these levels is good training data for reinforcement learning. It's not like there's noisy data or the label is wrong or something. Um, but it seems to be quite important to accurately select the levels we want to train on. So that is that is an interesting thing by itself. Uh, but you what you'll see in this algorithm is that they always will first evaluate a level determine whether the regret is high or whether it is in the zone of proximal development and only then use this that level to actually train the agent on. That is interesting. So we compute this regret, and we add the level to the buffer. So the level here is this um, theta. So these are the parameters again here that we evolve, we evolve two sets of parameters, the parameters of uh, pi, which is the students uh, policy, but that is just a very simple proximal policy optimization reinforcement learning algorithm right here, we don't actually care what kind of RL algorithm it is as long as it can learn. Uh, the interesting parameters here are the parameters of the levels. And this could be the level itself in case of this maze, or it could be the, the parameters 
No, actually, it would be the level, the level itself, right? It needs to be an actual instantiation of the level, not just the parameters that you enter into the generator, unless the generator is deterministic. And we only add it to the buffer if the score meets a threshold. So that is where we filter out things where the regret is either um, where the regret is too low. So only if it is a hard level for the student to solve, we uh, put it into the buffer and we'll get to how we actually filter out the levels that are too hard in a second. So that's just if we decide we need a new level, if we decide actually that we want to go into the, the buffer, we're going to sample a level that we've previously added into the buffer. And remember, we've determined that all of these are in the zone of proximal development, we train, we collect the policy, and we actually train. So this is where we train, we train on a level that we sampled from the buffer in the first place. It's the only time we train the agent at all. And then we are not done with this level yet. Um, what we do is we take the same level that we just sampled, and we actually edit it. So here, edit to produce a uh, theta prime. And the editing can be, as I said, anything as long as you can reasonably assume that any edit will not distort the difficulty too much, right? So it needs to distort the difficulty somewhat, but not too much. Um, again, we collect the trajectory, we do not train it, we do not, tr we simply run the student on the new levels, exact same way we did before, we compute the regret, and we add it to the buffer if the score meets a threshold, optionally update the editor using the score. So that that can be uh, the the editor itself could be some sort of dynamic algorithm or not. So that is the algorithm in a nutshell, it's pretty simple, there is a buffer, I train on levels inside the buffer and only on levels that are inside the buffer. How do levels get into the buffer? Two ways. Uh, they can be sampled either from the level generator, or they can be edited from levels that are already in the buffer. However, both of them will only get into the buffer if they if we evaluate the agent on them first, compute its regret, and if the regret is higher than some threshold, that's how we curate the buffer. And that's it. Um, that's the entire algorithm. So they have a bunch of experiments right here. And uh, th that's, it's probably better to go back to the website to look at the experiments. So da -da -da -da. Oh, no, we need to look at what the regret is, obviously. <laughs> so regret is just a, the, the way it's formulated right here, uh, the regret is the difference between the expected rewards of two policy. So if I have a, this here is regret. So the regret of theta, and now you know theta is a level, right? So the regret uh, specific to a level would be, and here is policy one and policy two. Now in this case, it's the current policy and the optimal policy. But you can see down here, uh, the regret can be defined over any two arbitrary policies. It is simply the difference in the values of the two policies. And what's the value? The value is the expected future reward. And if I pose it like this, it's probably just the expected reward. So the formulation right here, um, where I plug in the optimal policy, uh, would simply be, you know, what um, I have some sort of level, right? and I have my current agent right here. And the agent expects to get some sort of reward, like maybe it gets onto here, and then it crashes. So that's a reward of I don't know, 50. And the optimal policy, if the level is solvable at all, could actually go to the end and solve it and get a reward of 100. So my regret in this case would be 50. And that is a good measure of how difficult a level is or let's say how much you can still learn from that level. Because if a level is too difficult, and that's the catch, 
If a level is too difficult, then not even the optimal policy will be able to achieve much in that level. And therefore, you know, why are you like, what point is it to go to that level and actually um, solve it? Or if there is any stochasticity is if, if a level needs a lot of luck, right, then as well, uh, the expected the expected reward, the expected future reward of the optimal policy will also be not super high. So by selecting things that have high regret, meaning that have a high difference between the optimal policy and the current policy, we select for levels that where the current student can still learn a lot of things. Uh, so it's still there's still headroom to learn. Now, the optimal policy is obviously hard to compute, because if we had it, we wouldn't have to solve the problem. So um, that there is a uh, an approximation we need to do because we don't have access to the optimal policy. And the approximation is this thing right here, which is called the positive value loss. This is from previous work. By the way, this this work is essentially a combination of two previous works. Uh, this, uh, this PLR, I don't it's okay, I don't remember exactly right now what it stands for. But what PLR does is it also uses this regret objective but it simply applies it to randomly generated levels. So it randomly generates, and it just curates that random, uh, random those randomly generated levels. And the other thing that it borrows from is evolutionary methods, which um, maintain the evolutionary methods always maintain a population, and they do this sort of editing the population, and then evaluating their fitness. However, most of the evolutionary methods, they are have very hand tailored things of what it means to be fit. So the fitness function um, could be quite, uh, quite specific to a given environment. And remember, we're not, we're not evolving the, um, the agents here, uh, which of which fitness would obviously just be like, how well can you solve a level, uh, we're evolving the levels themselves. So the idea of this paper right here is to simply use the regret and uh, as a fitness function, and then curate the levels according to the according to the regret. So it brings in evolution into the PLR algorithm with regret being the fitness that's, I guess, formulated in two different ways. So the positive value loss, let's unpack that real quick. Um, they, it, it stems from this thing right here, a uh, delta k, delta k is the uh, TD error at time step t. So if I'm in a level, and I'm at some time, time, these are the time steps and the observations that I make through the time steps, the TD error is I can compute after I've completed the episode. So at each step, I've gotten some sort of reward, maybe my reward here is r1, my reward here is r2, r3, r4, and so on. Uh, so in temporal difference learning, uh, what I do is I always at each point in time, let's say I'm here, uh, I want to estimate my future reward that I'm going to make. And that would be my value function, right? So my value function tells me what the future reward will hold. Now I can estimate the reward one step into the future or two steps into the future or three steps and so on. My temporal difference error is simply and I'm if it's written like this, I think that's uh, I'm not entirely sure if that's like a TD lambda or a TD one error. Uh, but in general, what I can do is I can just predict all of my future rewards. And the difference between what I predict my future rewards to be and what they actually are, which I know after I've completed the episode, that's my TD error, that's my temporal difference error, I can use the temporal difference error to learn uh, a value function. Because otherwise, I'd have to learn the value function just from the rewards that I get. And the TD error is a bit more of a smooth objective. And I believe it converges to the same thing, ultimately. But you can reduce the variance a little bit under certain assumptions. The TD error that we're interested in right here, it doesn't matter if we if the agent uses it to learn or not, 
but the agent simply predicts the future rewards uh, along the way as it solves the level. After the level is completed, we compare that to the actual rewards that it got. We calculate the difference of that, and that becomes the TD error. And then we sum up the TD error across from each time step, I can calculate a TD error, right? Um, so I can do that from each time step. If I'm at time step t, uh, I can look ahead. Uh, okay, yeah, I can look ahead from each time step until the end. And probably possibly the, the TD error could be uh, looking from from either from or to that particular time step. That is not exactly specified, I would have to go and read this paper, possibly or the PLR paper. It's not super important. Uh, we can add that up. Here are some discount factors that we use for that. But you can disregard these for now. Essentially, it simply means okay, from time step t on, you know, how wrong am I about the future? And what we're going to do is we're going to apply a relu to that. So essentially, we're going to cap it at zero, which means that, um, I'm only going to be interested in wherever I under or overestimate. Now let's think about this. Wherever I overestimate. So the TD error, as far as I know, is uh, the value <laughs> minus the reward. Correct me if that's a different way around. But it's what I estimate minus what it truly is. Now, if this is high, it means that I completely overestimated my ability to achieve reward in this level. And that could be, you know, a good level to train on. If I underestimated my ability to achieve reward, then I'm, I'm going to guess that uh, that level might be easier than I had anticipated. So but if I overestimated that level might be harder than I anticipated. And that's exactly the levels that I want to train at. So I'm going to cap that at zero, I'm going to sum that up across all the time steps. And if this number is very high, it means that throughout the level, I consistently overestimated my ability to make progress in this level to get reward. And therefore, that level should go into the buffer. So this is the approximation to regret that we're going to use right here. And now you have the entire algorithm. Okay, uh, generate levels, give them to the student, evaluate them, evaluate this measure, does the student under or overestimate its ability, if it overestimates its ability, put it into the buffer, um, then take stuff from the buffer, uh, train the student on it, give it to the editor, modify it, and evaluate the student again on it, if the student overestimates its ability on the edited levels, put them back into the buffer and train on them. That's it. You can also see a little bit why this doesn't necessarily suggest levels that are way too hard. Because if you had a level that was way too hard, uh, the student might even correctly estimate that it's not going to uh, make a lot of a lot of progress there. Because it's pretty easy to recognize that you're not going to make a lot of progress, uh, if the level is super duper hard, right. So the levels that this is going to select again, is exactly the levels where um, the students student thinks it should do well, but it doesn't really do well. So let's look a bit into the experiments. Um, the experiments, as I said, are best probably viewed on this website, because they're a bit interactive. So what they first do is they come up with these lava grid levels and has the website crashed again. So the lava Oh no, these are the lava grid levels. Um, they're procedurally generated, the agent must get to the goal while avoiding the lava grids. And as the experiments show these get progressively harder and harder. They next go to these mazes. And Excel starts from just empty rooms. So they start from empty rooms. And up here, I believe you can see some of the generated levels by this algorithm. And the website has indeed crashed. Let's refresh. So if we look at what levels it generates, you can see that the levels are, they're fairly difficult, right? 
but they're also kind of random. They don't really look like human levels. Um, so you might be a bit doubtful of whether that's going to help in mazes that we typically know. But you can clearly see the progress from the initially empty rooms to it filling up and to actually becoming harder and harder and harder. And if you then evaluate these things on levels that humans have designed, so there's this benchmark right here, it will do pretty well, especially against these other methods uh, that also do curriculum evolution of, of levels. So especially things here like la large corridor or so, these are very difficult. Uh, the agent only gets a little window around itself to view. It doesn't get an overview over the entire um, over the entire level. And therefore, it needs to sort of keep in mind things that it did previously. And that is a hard task. And they even this is really cool. What they do is they they have the agent generalize, I believe from 16 by 16 grids, which they train on to this 51 by 51 grid. And you can see that the agent, it kind of follows, it goes like left, always left. Um, and that works because this maze does has no loops. Um, at least I believe it has no loops. So it in the end, it actually finds the goal. Uh, why this is exactly 51 by 51? I don't know, maybe because the inside then is 50 by 50, or because that was just the largest maze that it worked on. But it is astounding that it can sort of generalize to much, much larger uh, things. Because in the small mazes, it is conceivable that it could kind of keep all of its all of its history and memory. But here you can really see that it has learned to develop an actual algorithm for what it does, right? So there is an algorithm like always go left. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, I could, you know, could watch forever. Um, then they go on to to these terrains. And again, uh, the thing here is that without handcrafting fitness functions or anything like this, just purely based on these regret measures, uh, this these levels, they continuously evolve, which you can see right here, uh, in what directions the levels evolve. So first, uh, steps are increased, then stair heights, and so on. And at the end, you'll have a generally capable agent. They, they compare this. Um, so they do some ablations. But interestingly, sorry, they compare this to poet. And poet is an interesting algorithm because poet trains a population of agents. So poet will always pair environments and agents and try to get the best achieving population of agents, which leads to very specialized agents for very specialized types of environments. So the comparison is not exactly accurate. Uh, but they do, I believe they do show that their algorithm takes a lot less interactions, obviously, because it's only one student, and poet has an entire population of students. Um, and they also analyze over the course of training, how their levels would fall into poets because poet has a categorization of levels of which ones are easy and hard and so on. And as you can see right here, it starts off with a lot of easy levels on the left and quite a bit of challenging levels, but not very many very challenging or extremely challenging levels. And as time progresses, you can see that at least a little bit the proportion of easy levels, it sort of takes a back seat. And then the proportion of extremely challenging levels increases. What is also interesting, at least for me, is that um, it there's not a monotone, monotonic development into the direction of challenging levels. And that is what, you know, I believe, maybe this might be a little bit of a sign of, uh, of this catastrophic forgetting, because this is only a single agent. Essentially, if you train it into one direction, it might forget the other directions that exist. And specifically, it might you might forget how to do easy levels, because there's always a hill in the challenging levels, it might fall over once it just encounters a flat plane. I've actually seen this a bunch of times in in the, the trial runs that I did on the website. So it's pretty interesting to see that even though 
extremely challenging levels get added and there's certainly more very challenging level than at the beginning and and less easy levels it, it, it does not converge to only having extremely challenging levels. So that is also interesting. Here you can see a little bit of a comparison, notably the top row, a poet is a population based algorithm, um, as you can see here, which is what makes it different here and not super duper comparable. Um, then the other ones are so the PLR, as you can see, it also uses the minimax regret strategy to curate levels. However, there is no uh, it, it simply relies on random sampling from the generator, whereas Excel uses the random sampling plus evolution, which essentially means that it pairs the PLR algorithm with the poet algorithm. And that appears to work quite well. So that is all that I wanted to say on this work. There's a lot more to say, but I hope that is, is being clarified in the interview with the authors. What is a bit a bit worrisome to me about this paper is just the fact that while they frame it as oh, this is very general, this needs essentially no heuristics and so on. I believe that is not entirely the case. I believe there's a lot of domain knowledge that kind of gets sneaked in side. For example, we need the this, um, we need this threshold, right on, we need the threshold on the regret. So there is a threshold, only if it hits the threshold, we put it into the buffer, like they criticize poet for filtering levels where the agent gets between five, uh, 50 and 300 reward. And they kind of say, well, that's kind of really, you know, arbitrary and is really made for that level. And I agree. But then there is kind of a, a regret threshold, which um, is, again, that is kind of a hyperparameter that I'm gonna guess that you have to tune. And the same thing goes for, you know, how do I edit these levels and so on. I believe them that it can be an arbitrary editor. But again, this is, uh, it's, it's very specific. And I believe what is most specific here is just the choice of um, the choice of tasks that you go about not every task and I would argue that few very few tasks are actually uh, lend themselves to this kind of evolution. Because again, you need a very you need to be able to create a very smooth trajectory from easy to hard, where the same or similar strategies um, will solve all the different difficulties. And uh, in addition, you need also to, to be able for the editor to edit levels in such a way that such a path can be created, right. And you need to avoid the catastrophic forgetting, you can't evolve into too many different things at the same time, and so on. But I do think it's a cool method. And there's certainly certainly applications and curriculum learning, I think is one of the most interesting things that we can currently do. Uh, because uh, gone are the days of like you essentially shift some responsibility from the agent algorithm to the environment creation algorithm, which I like, right? Because we've seen, a, we've seen scaling up of agents dramatically, drastically, and maybe um, we can end up with a leaner agent if we shift some of that learning uh, difficulty to the environment. All right, that's what I had to say. Thank you very much for listening. Bye bye. Thank you.